Welcome to A Walk in the Park with Animal Friends. Today we have our team from Joy. So Sam, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks Patricia, it's great to be back. So I am Sam Webster and I'm the Clinical Director of Operations uh, at Joy Pet Care. Joy Pet Care, the one-stop shop for all of your accessible and affordable veterinary and pet care needs. We are an app and if you haven't downloaded it, I'd encourage everybody to go and do so because we can help you get the expertise you need for your pet from the comfort of your sofa. And also uh, access 24 seven to online veterinary consultations, which as you know, for all animal friends, policyholders are completely free. Lovely. Thank you, Sam, and welcome back. Thanks for coming back. I didn't scare you off last season, you which not. is fabulous. I'm excited to be back on Zoom. Yeah. And Nat, welcome. Hello. Do you want to introduce yourself and what yes. you do at Joy? Um, so at Joy, I help uh, people with their pets, predominantly cats and dogs, and I provide a behaviour and training service. So any issues that you are um, currently experiencing with your cat or dog, uh, get in touch through all the ways that Sam's just explained, which I don't need to do again, which is great. Thanks for that. I, I love the tag teaming. <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to talk all things uh, autumn, seasonal content, things to think about with your pet. So now we're going to kick off with some uh, seasonal content today. Mm -hmm. And we're talking all things autumn and how to keep your pet healthy and happy. Can cats and dogs suffer from seasonal affective disorder? Hmm, well, you know, SAD syndrome is probably quite well known in, you know, humans. Yes. The night's drawing, we're sad. Yes. There's not as so much sunlight, it's rainy. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of research into that as a disorder or a, mm -hmm. you know, medical issue um, in cats and dogs, it's, it's probably not as, as well thought of, but they're going to be affected by the same things that we are. Yep. So less daylight hours, you know, um, the cold, yep. the rain, um, maybe spending less time with their humans because by the time we, you know, get home from work and go to bed, it's not like we're sat out on a lovely summer's, summer's mm. evening and uh, drinking g and teas in the sun with them. So. Uh, yeah, I think it may be not as um, technically as a disorder, but yep. there's certainly going to be changes in terms of the environment and, you know, the daily routines that will affect them. Yeah. And if they are feeling a little bit down, it might not be seasonal affective disorder, mm -hmm. but it might just be changes to environment, as you said. What are some of the things that we can do to help our cats and dogs to feel a bit better during that time? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the main thing for me is, you know, wet play did you have that at school where it was wet play <laughs> yeah and you uh, i don't know if they do that anymore i haven't got kids but um it, you know it was too rainy to go outside mm -hmm. so you would sit in and play i don't know snap or yep. connect four and we need some equivalents for our cats and dogs so that uh, you know if it is really miserable for yep. day 10 in a row you can just stay inside and give them some maybe play some hunting games with their food uh maybe play some chasey sort of predatory games with your your cat or yep. some um sort of find it games with your dog i think just thinking outside the box and um making sure that they have that daily enrichment that might be reduced slightly where yep. you're not going out on all these walks and um i don't know about you but i don't tend to let my dogs off as much off lead in the dark yes. so they get more lead walks yeah. so i may be going somewhere new, you yeah. know, so there's new sniffs for them, or I take them out on errands a lot more. So at least they've got out of the house a bit more. Mm. And that's the challenge So for, for Skye. She's she's a big dog, German shirt, a short haired pointer. She needs to be off lead mm -hmm. really. So those lead walks are just painful for, for everyone. <laughs> but I suppose I didn't really think about the whole mental stimulation side of it. If they're having less physical activity, you know, those mental games are a great way to be able to help enrich their lives and, and make them happier. So uh, one of the games that we like to play is hide and seek, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's seeking me. So she has yep. to come and find me or my daughter and we take it in turns to hide upstairs and downstairs. And yeah, she gets a real kick out of that. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's 
uh, thinking of that kind of brain game element yeah. when maybe physical exercise is, is going to be slightly reduced. You know, when we go on holiday and we're doing less physical stuff, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you're going on a beach holiday, you still keep your brain busy by reading the book, don't yeah. you? So it, it's that kind of stuff, but, but for our dogs and cats. Fab. So moving on from rainy days and, and a little less exercise, Sam, can our pets catch seasonal bugs like we get sometimes, like like a stomach flu or colds? Or what does that look like in the cat and dog world? Definitely. I think um, at that time of year when things are a little colder, the weather's usually a little bit wetter, um, and we tend to find that humans' uh, immune systems drop a little and more susceptible more susceptible to bugs, particularly viruses. And the same can be said of our dogs and cats, Um, usually less along the lines of the flu and the sniffles, although kennel cough can be really rife. Mm. There can be a lot of uh, sniffing and coughing dogs when the wet weather is around that does spread. But particularly upset tummies, so there's vomiting and diarrhea bugs. They tend to spike every year around January, February, but can be seen as early as the autumn months. So definitely something to bear in mind. So just on that vomiting and diarrhea, I know it's a terrible topic and no one really wants to talk about it (laughs) because it's quite grim. But what are the key things to look out for for your dog and cat? Because, I mean, surely unless they're in like real distress, what's what's the best way to help them? Yeah, of course. And it is, like you say, unless there's real distress, a bit like ourselves, you would, if you had a mild upset tummy, you wouldn't immediately rush off to the GP. So Mm -hmm. what can you do at home uh, with those cases that are nice and mild and likely to fix within a day or two? Yeah. So most of these things are viruses, as Mm -hmm. we've already said. Um, So they don't necessarily need treatment. You don't need antibiotics. You don't need anything like that. So I think the key things to think about and to look for in your pet are how many times have they been sick or yep. had an upset stomach? Are they still keen on eating and drinking? Mm-hmm. How long has this been going on for? And how much energy have they got as well? Some yep. pets will be sick once or twice and still want to run around and go for that two hour walk outside. Others will be ready to lie down and feel a bit sorry for themselves. So if your pet's still looking pretty well, they're still happy to eat and drink. It's not been going on for more than say a day or two. Mm-hmm. Usually diet and probiotics are the way to treat your pet at home. Yep. So get a really good quality diet that's going to help replenish all that good gut bacteria. Microbiome is so important for our pets, just like it is in humans as well. Yeah. Uh, if you're seeing anything that's slightly more concerning there, if your pet's not themselves, if this has been ticking on for a while, uh, at that point, you're best to speak to a vet. Yep. And actually, our symptom checker on the app is perfect for that. You can answer these questions and we'll give you an indication of whether you should maybe speak to one of our teams use a product at home or if that's an emergency and we should send you straight in the door to talk to your vet in person yeah and i've used it myself for for when sky had uh, both sickness and diarrhea and the journey was so simple and easy right i know uh, nobody really wants to go back through their phone pictures and then see pictures of both (laughs) vomiting and diarrhea on it amazed how many people have them yeah (laughs) but uploading them in and then um actually came through to to speak to one of the vets um who did some great remote checks on her and just to make sure that she wasn't dehydrated and I think really at that point it was more just putting my mind at ease because yeah. she'd been sick quite a lot she wasn't really feeling herself and then the advice was keep an eye on her if you're worried ring back but you don't need to rush anywhere and actually within a couple of days she was as right as rain again but you have some really great success rates from a, a diarrhea and vomiting perspective with remote consultations. We do as we've said there um, diet and probiotics Mm. lifestyle changes, management at home, how we treat these viral bugs. And actually, you don't necessarily need to go through the door of your vets to do that. And that's something you're doing at home. And you just touched on there, a lot of it is reassurance. With your children or yourself, they can tell you what's going on. With our pets, you're kind of playing an educated guessing game. Mm. Um, And having a professional who can sit down and do that with you, assess your pet on the phone, and then say, well, actually, you're bang on, trust your gut, or actually, I'd advise something more kind of yeah. urgent that that's what we need that's what we really do need um, often they're bouncing around 24 hours later pretending <laughs> nothing was a problem yeah and i'll tell you what your vet will appreciate you sending us a picture of whatever your pet has done with their upset tummy so, rather than so taking don't, a sample in the door okay so don't is, feel ashamed about picturing taking a picture of it do not judge what you have in your camera reel <laughs> if anything it can be really really helpful to us to help kind of diagnose your pet and see how seeing what we need to do to treat them. Fab. Any other seasonal things that we should be looking out for? 
So I did touch on kennel cough as well there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a problem all year round. And I think we all know at this point that the name kennel cough expecting to catch that in kennels it's just not true it's anywhere that pets are uh, kind of in big populations so dog parks going on a walk where lots of other dogs go i think there was a big um, bout of it at uh, spread on beaches last year when mm. everybody was staying in the uk for their staycations yep um so that can be bad it is again it's mostly viral there is some bacterial kind of component which means antibiotics are needed for those severe cases Again, talk to us, use our symptom checker, we'll help you triage whether your pet needs to go and get those medications or if they should fix in a few days. And the one thing I would say is if your dog does have kennel cough and you know about it, stay away from other dogs. Yeah. A bit like when we do have everyone a else a favour. Yeah. Keep the kids at home, exactly. Let's let's um, work together to stamp it out. Yep, fab. And you touched on there around walking and the spreading of these things. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what are some of your top tips for safer autumn walks? Uh, good question, Patricia. I think we talked about earlier that the uh, the light is starting to go. So often around your workday, you'll be walking in the dark. So mm. visibility is key. Keep yourself and your pet safe yeah. um, and other people safe too. I used to have a dog, Frank, bless his soul. He's not with us anymore. But his favorite thing to do on autumn and winter walks was to sneak up behind other walkers on the <laughs> and then give a loud bark. He's, no. Don't know why. He's, he's good all year round otherwise, but he likes yeah. to give them a bit of a jump scare. So putting him in a flashing collar and a big bright vest yep. stop that problem from happening. Um, but road safety as well, making sure that you are not going to get caught by a car if you're walking on pavements. Um, cyclists, motorcyclists as well. Uh, and I think just try and adapt your patterns if you can a little bit, yep. just to again, stay safe. Um, I think people tend to move towards middle of the day walks if they can. Keep away from areas that get really wet and boggy, particularly if your pet has been unwell or you know there's something going around. So sometimes mm -hmm. evening walks on the pavement are better at that time of year than necessarily crossing over the fields or going on the beach. Okay. Yeah, Sky's very on brand in the winter. She has a bright pink flashing collar <laughs> to make sure that everyone can see her because she's quite dark, so you can't really see her. So um, we, we've got our own feelings about whether pets should be dressed up in fancy dress. It's not a thing that I'm particularly keen on. But what about jumpers and coats to help protect them in different weathers? I mean, how do they adapt to that? Are they necessary? They shouldn't be necessary. If you look at evolution, I'm sure Nat will have some opinions on this as well. <laughs> Dogs do come from wolves. They mm -hmm. are designed with a nice warm wool fur coat to keep them warm. Um, and most dogs should not require us to put any extra layers on to keep them warm and dry. Yep. However, there's always exceptions to the rule. And let's be honest, a chihuahua or a greyhound doesn't look like a wolf. Yeah. Um, so every pet is a di bit different. I think you have to use your judgment on the individual case. Um, my mother has uh, a lurcher i think he is so he's a greyhound skinny little yeah. boy he can't stand being wet he won't go for walks when the rain's on unless he gets his waterproof jacket on at which point he's off like nothing's, oh, like nothing's lovely. happened yeah because he's so thin he has such little body fat that he gets really cold really easily if yeah wants. as where sky won't go out in the garden for a wee when it's raining yeah. but walks she's like yeah let's go she knows she's going right. on an adventure yeah exactly it doesn't bother her. yeah i mean nat do you have yeah. any kind of input from a behavior perspective yeah I think um, us humans have got involved, haven't we, in uh, artificial yeah. selection there and maybe ruined a few of those wolf-like coats. True. So I'm thinking of, you know, little little cloud dogs, they'll call them, with, you know, a thin coat. They're close to the ground. They're probably not going to enjoy going through the puddles. Um, and I think if, if, if listeners know their dogs and how roughy tufty they are yeah you know again it's about adaptation isn't it so um and having those kind of alternatives for if um your dog doesn't like walking in the rain but you still want to get them out and about maybe those little cloud dogs might like to go for a coffee instead in the day yeah um with Definitely. you obviously i mean if they went on their own that would be quite clever um <laughs> not sure how they're paying <laughs> Contact list, definitely. Yeah. Just on the collar. There you go. The poor kit money. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, look at that. Yeah, loving that. We didn't set that up, I promise. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I do have things like fleeces and waterproof coats. And um, I kind of play it by ear a bit. I mean, the biggest thing I would use uh, a jumper 
for would be if my dog had got soaking wet mm-hmm. and I was then popping out to do some errands before I got home. Yeah. yeah. So I'd want to towel them off where I was and then maybe put something cozy on so, so that they, they don't, don't get, get too cold. cold. Yeah, because Sky has a fleece, but we will use it in snow, essentially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, she moves around so much generally she doesn't get cold but afterwards if she has got damp then she can get a bit chilly and that's at that point that I'd pop that on you mentioned movement there I think um, small puppies who maybe necessarily aren't need more energy so mm-hmm. they they um, can easily get cold because of their size and their, their surface area but also older pets as well who maybe yeah. don't move as fast those are good candidates for a nice warm jumper or a rainproof coat because they do feel the cold easily and they're not doing that kind of exercise to, to generate that body heat. Yep. So we're talking a bit about walking there. Mm-hmm. What about uh, paw care after walking? So wiping paws, should you do it after every walk? What are the risks if it's been raining or there's been salt out? What should we be looking for? I think as a general rule, most dogs will look after their own feet the way they will with the rest of their coat. I mean, they must spend half their life grooming and keeping themselves looking as beautiful as they all are. Yeah, Um, at 3 a.m. Sky likes to do that. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know why. It just seems to be the time for it. It's supposed to annoy you, I think, and wake you up. Um, But yeah, a couple of instances where where it's worth keeping an eye on paws. So you mentioned salt. If there's been heavy gritting down Mm -hmm. and your dog has been walking on on that, uh, that can start to irritate the uh, kind of delicate tissue between the toes okay so having a little bit of a rinse off you don't need to get in there and scrub but if you just give those those feet a, a wash in some nice clean warm water yeah that'll that'll sort that out um and the other instance would just be when they've got really muddy partly yeah. to save your sofa and your carpets and <laughs> your house but also just to get uh, the thick of the muck off and um, particularly if you're in a risk area for something like alabama rock you need to wash that off just to make sure that you're checking for any skin lesions as well. Yeah. And now, just talking about paws, mm-hmm. what's the best way if a dog or cat doesn't like their paws being touched? How do you, well, hopefully desensitise them to that? Because there are points that you're going to have to touch their paws. Yeah, um, massively common. Um, and that can be either because the dog hasn't been introduced to, or cat um, hasn't been introduced to having their paws touched properly uh, or they've maybe um, had a bad experience or those of us that have lived with a puppy can probably imagine the play fight that ensued when you're trying to tell them dry Um, so I I very much have a bit of a hands-off approach really Um, I would uh, do some poor touch for food outside of the I need to dry your paws Mm -hmm. environment so you know in the winter it's not going to be a surprise that it rains in this country. No. It's not going to be a surprise that all dog's paws will get muddy. So set up your environment so that you don't have to do this grab and clean every time they come in from the garden. Yeah. Um, maybe cordon off an area. So in our garden, I got fed up of, of the paws. Mm-hmm. So we we laid a kind of dry garden, a gravel garden. Yeah. Um, and that's the only bit that the dogs have access to in the winter. Yep. So, um, and towels down. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues um, who is no longer with us, sadly, he uh, went through a phase of just getting quite... Um, sensitive paws when and he would you know nibble at them and all sorts Mm. so um i trained him to walk through like a sheep dip amazing (laughs) so just got a cat litter tray put that by the back door and then when he would come in he would just walk through that um and hey presto then onto the towels and he's dry so any external substrate's gone yeah you know like the salt or grit that uh, sam mentioned um and i haven't had to go through the stress because if it, your dog's going to learn yeah. that you are going to do their paws as yeah. soon as they come in. So what you're going to likely end up with is either that becomes a fight and that's not fun yeah. for anyone or your dog's going to come, come in. They won't come in. <laughs> so, you know, I think think outside the box a little bit and think yeah. of some yeah. ways that you can do it with minimal yeah. contact, but obviously then doing your usual husbandry, desensitisation, counter conditioning. Yeah. So... Paws are a key thing, obviously, but some of the things that they can walk through, we've talked about salt, grit, all of those kind of stuff, mud. But what about antifreeze, Sam? I've heard antifreeze is obviously not great. It's not one of the nicest chemicals that we use on a regular basis, Patricia. Yeah. Um, 
not so much an issue uh, walking through it or skin contact so much. Although mm -hmm. if you were aware that your pet had walked through it, I would recommend in that instance, that's one time I would have a wrestle with your pet and wash it off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the main problem is when they lick it. Yes. Particularly cats, that's highly toxic and they can be very sick very quickly. So if you do have antifreeze at home, which we all need to get out at certain times of year, mm -hmm. um, keep it safe, keep it locked away. And when you've used it, put the rest of the bottle away. And what kind of uh, symptoms will they display if they've ingested it? So pets will become quite uh, sleepy, lethargic. They can vomit. Um, they can show what we call neurological signs. So they can get all wobbly, look like they've had one too many pints at the pub. Yeah. And they can, if it's really bad and we haven't noticed it for a while, they can collapse and almost go into a coma. Yeah. If you notice any of those signs or you are worried, that is an instance where I would never use the Joy app. I will get straight onto your local vet because they're yep. going to need hands-on care pretty fast. Okay, great. So good, good tip there. Thank you. Uh, we talked about washing paws, but now if we can just jump back to you, mm -hmm. what about bathing or bathing dogs and cats? Mm -hmm. Although I'd probably do that in a bodysuit. <laughs> Um, at your own risk. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Disclaimer alert. <laughs> how do you how do you desensitise them to having that routine and being able to do those things with them? Uh, well, first off, I uh, I don't regularly bathe my dogs. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I don't use kind of shampoos or, or anything like that and give them a full on you know grooming experience. Yeah, they get rinsed off. Uh, they uh, so I have um, like a you can buy these mobile pumps. It looks like a petrol yeah, yeah. can, yeah. and I fill that up with warm water when I'm going out on a muddy walk, yeah. and then they get sprayed down and towed down. And so I, I brush them all every day, and pretty much that keeps their coat in in good nick. Really, yeah. um, it's only if they get the dreaded fox poo oh. that um, you know bath time has to happen. And I think. Really, if you're looking at that minimal approach and that kind of um, maintenance of, of the coat in a different yeah. way, then um, you can just once a week stick them in the bath with some nice treats. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be any more difficult than that. Yeah. Um, some dogs will actually worry about the flooring on a bath. It's mm. quite slippy. So yeah, yeah. Always put a mat or a t I, put, I just put a towel down yeah. so they've got something to grip onto. Um, I didn't even think about the whole surface oh, gosh, and what yeah. that might I mean, feel basically like. Basically putting them in a big slippy ice yeah, cream, yeah, yeah. Um, you, If it's something that you want to do more regularly um, and it's not too much of an outlet in terms of um, finance, a warm outdoor tap Mm -hmm. is a life changer for me <laughs> so just got that plumbed in so yeah. now i can walk around the back if i forget my little petrol yep. can of, of warm water not petrol by the way <laughs> <laughs> please don't misconstrue what i'm saying um i can walk them around the back of the house yeah quick hose down towel down back in snooze on the sofa yeah and then it means that you don't have to take them in and out the bathroom or yeah. towel anything through the house or i mean i've got a wolfhound so how am i going to do that yeah that's yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> luckily yeah. sky short hair so apart from the whole fox poo yeah, incidents yeah. Yeah. which have happened the rest of the time her coat really takes care of itself i mean she's her coat's in immaculate condition yeah and i think even if even if you have got a dog or a cat that's pretty low maintenance, future-proof them. Yeah. You never know, especially with cats. One of the signs that they might be in pain or you know struggling to cope with something is um, either not grooming or grooming too much. Yeah. Um, and so you might have to help them out. You might have to help Sky out if she, I don't know, had some kind of acute injury. Yeah. So it's still good to practice that kind of handling yes so that if you do need to do it from a maintenance point yep. of view and that that can just be you know one of those mitts yep uh, with a short head dog yeah um so i think yeah just regular stuff use food um there's all sorts of weird wonderful things on the market that you can get like little suction rubber bone things that you cover in marmite or cheese or whatever yeah. stick that to the bath just put them in there touch them no yeah. water yeah and then get them out so i think and that preparation's key right oh, yeah. so that although you might not need to do it today you're just desensitizing yeah. them and showing that it can be a positive experience in the future should you need to do that exactly and 
you know, all, all of this um, handling and, and sort of husbandry practice is something that I think is maybe lacking in most households mm-hmm. with, with dogs and cats because we tend to want to teach, you know, tricks and handstands and sits and downs and all that kind of stuff. And we forget the, well, people think it's boring, but mm-hmm. I, I love that kind of training. I love that, you know, give me your paw, let me file yeah. it for you or whatever, or let me look in your eye, let me yeah. pretend to take a tick off of you, because that's real life stuff. Yeah. You know? And if we look at it, that should maybe be the more focus on, on you know, if we are going to be doing training. Um, yeah. And if we, if we also work on our dogs being resilient and trusting us in those situations where they might need to be restrained, um, they're more likely to bounce back from something. Yep. So, you know, even one of my dogs, for example, that I haven't actually put in the bath, you know, if I needed to, because I've done all this other stuff in the background, yep. it's likely not to be as, as big, big a deal, deal as it could be if yep. I hadn't also done all the confidence building. Yeah, and that, I think that's just given me an idea for a whole nother episode <laughs> about just prepping, yep. prepping your pets, essentially, yep. for those experiences. So... Sam, we've touched on uh, mud, and I know we keep going back to that, but there is a, a serious um, disease that breaks in the, in the UK, I think seasonally, but I'll let you, as the professional, talk about it a lot more. But I don't think many people have really heard about Al- Alabama rot. Yes, it's a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell our listeners, what is it? No, is the short answer, I'm afraid, Patricia. We're still not sure. So okay. Alabama rot is, you're right when you say it's a seasonal problem. We're not quite sure what causes it, but particularly around the wetter autumn into winter months, there is a condition in certain spots in the UK where dogs will get really sick. Um, the first things you'll see are little skin sores, usually around the feet and the legs or on the face, where mm-hmm. usually where your dog's gone and got in contact with something, having a root around the bushes and the yep. puddles. Um, but that can lead, because it affects the blood vessels, it also affects the blood vessels in the kidneys, so they can go into kidney failure. Yep. It can be a really serious and life-threatening condition. Um, and it starts up looking, looking as simple as a, a little scratch or a little sore on a paw. And does it just affect dogs or can it affect cats as well? It just affects dogs uh, as far as we know at this point. We haven't seen any classic cases in cats um, or particularly in any of wildlife species, but there, there is potential. We're not sure what causes it, so it could change in the future. We could find that actually is affecting different animals in different ways and we just don't know yet. Yeah. So if you see something like that, what's the best thing to do? Could you speak to a joy vet and they may just then redirect you straight into practice? Yeah, of course. So it's worth... Kind of, I suppose, pointing out to our listeners that most skin lesions that you see or skin sores on your pet will not be Alabama yes. rot. There'll be something really simple, like yeah. they have, you know, gone in a bush and got a graze, or they have skin allergies, which is the number one problem that we see. Um, so make sure you're keeping your pet clean if they are muddy after walks. It's worth having a look online. I think Anderson Moore, our uh, veterinary yes. uh, specialist, who are really leading uh, the way in trying to break through what is this problem, how can we fix it. Mm-hmm. But they also give you a good indication if you look on their website of where areas in the country are that are at risk. So if you're in those kind of areas, avoid woodland and muddy fields if you can when you're walking your dogs in the end of the year, in the autumn and the winter months. If you are going to do that, and your dog particularly loves to run in those areas, make sure you do have a good towel off after a walk and clean, and then you can check. If you see anything on your pet's skin that you're worried about, talk to a vet, and that could be your local vet, that could be Joy. We can take a look at those pictures and we can advise you. Chances are we're going to err on the side of caution and get you checked out. Um, And what your vet is likely to do if they have any concerns is take a blood test and just check how your pet's kidneys are doing. Because there is no cure for this because we don't know what it is. So mm. we would support your pet until they recover. Okay. And that often means staying in hospital and being on fluids and other treatments. Okay. So Anderson Moore leading uh, research, research in the in this field. I know um, on the Animal Friends website, there's a blog as well talking about um, all the uh, symptoms and stuff to look out for. And I think it's got some of the geographical areas. But uh, as you're absolutely right, Anderson Moore are the, the leaders in that research. So I think I would be absolutely remiss in this conversation, given the fact that we're talking about autumn, if we didn't discuss fireworks. Mm. So, Nat, 
Mm-hmm. Is there a cause for anxiety around fireworks or can it vary for every dog that suffers? Noise, light, combination? Yep, ev- all of it. Okay. <laughs> um, everything that makes them spectacular and us go, ooh. <laughs> oh, make, yeah. yeah. Dogs, cats, horses, badgers, goats, yep. ducks, tortoises. Or, yep. you know, they all don't like it. We can't explain what they are. Mm. So... Um, it's a very loud, very sudden, very unpredictable uh, stimulus that it's very natural, uh, particularly for, for dogs, you know, having that sensitive hearing. Yeah. That it's not going to be something they're going to enjoy. Is there anything that you can do to help prepare leading up to fireworks night? Because I've not seen anything getting quieter. Let's be fair, mm-hmm. from a fireworks perspective, they just seem to be getting louder. So what can we do to help our pets prepare? Really hard, yeah. really hard, because most um, you know behaviour plans will be about desensitising and counter-conditioning. Yeah. And in order to do that and succeed in that, we have to have control of the stimulus. Yeah. So um, if my dog was scared of the smoke alarm, for example, mm-hmm. I could record it, turn it down to volume one, play it, food. Yeah. Play it, play tug, you know, and build it up gradually. Um, we can't do that with fireworks. It, it's a kind of, um, it is a, an assault on all the mm-hmm. senses because um, I've known a lot of dogs that have actually generalized that fear to any kind of bonfire smells. Okay. To uh, dark, cold nights. Yeah. They won't go out in the garden. Um, to just not going out in the garden at all. Mm. So um, I don't want to sound like it's a hopeless case, but, um, and there certainly is, you know, medication that can help and environmental changes. But in terms of prep, it's really noticing if your dog is sensitive to sounds generalized yeah. sounds, uh, making sure that they aren't in pain because the research shows that actually sensitivity to noises, particularly sudden noises, uh, is very closely linked to having pain. And you can imagine okay. why, if it startles them and then yeah. hurts, they make the association um, between the noise and pain. And um, when fireworks comes around, which is, you know, from about October to February, <laughs> um, just being present, being on guard about uh, you know the fact they might happen, yeah. um, soundproofing as much and masking as much, providing bolt holes and safe havens, mm-hmm. yeah, using medication if you need to, yeah. not walking at night, all those sensible things. And if your dog is is really that scared, um, particularly if it's busy with fireworks over that weekend, yeah, go on holiday. Okay. Book yourself a trip in the middle of nowhere <laughs> yeah. with your dog. Completely away. <laughs> with your dog, yeah. yeah. Um, or, you know, go for a midnight drive until it's all calmed down. Yeah. Because the one thing that we can guarantee with, with um, firework phobias is that they will get worse with more exposure, okay. not better. And have you seen any success with things like wraps or thunder jackets or anything like that? Are, are those product, can those products help? Um, the concepts are that they are providing a kind of swaddle yeah. and they're making the uh, dog feel uh, conscious about their, their body. Uh, I know that there are some studies happening at the moment, but yeah. for me the research isn't quite there yet. Okay. And my main concern would be that uh, the dog is actually shutting down rather right. than relaxing. Um, so. It, it will differ for individual dogs and I know there'll be some listeners out there thinking that oh my goodness my thunder jacket changed my dog's life yeah. you know uh, and that's great you've got to do what good works for, you. for your yeah, pet for yeah. you. but I think in some cases you know as humans we, we want to buy ourselves out of something don't we Oh, I'll try that. I'll try yeah, that. I'll yeah. try that. I'll try anything. Exactly. I'll try yeah. anything. And I, um, because otherwise it does sound hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> but I think um, it, it, it's up to the individual. And I would just be wary that you are really observing your dog mm. and you're providing them with, with what they need. Um, and most of the time that is comfort yeah. from you, uh, masking the sounds as much as possible and a little bolt hole. Yeah, because I've heard classical music is quite good to help soothe. 
Yeah, classic, class, classic FM do this lovely um, on on over fireworks now. Yeah, bonfire night. Uh, they play pet friendly music, oh, which nice. is, is lovely because yeah. sometimes classical music can sound like yeah. fireworks, right? Yeah. Um, or with the best intentions, you put the telly on loud and then there's fireworks on EastEnders. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, if you want something reliable, then yeah, uh, classic FM is pretty good. Most of the time, it's not actually about the music itself. It's masking the external noises and yeah. having a kind of a constant rather than um, being disturbed by sudden bangs. Yeah. So uh, I think it, it's it's good to knock around as well your neighbours and just check if they're planning on having like a fireworks party. Hopefully it goes without saying that you should not have fireworks in your own garden if you have a dog or cat or horses. Or, yeah. Um, go to a, d- a display and keep your pets safe somewhere but um at least if you know they're planning it you can go out yeah or at least plan to be in and helping your dog yeah. through it there's something else you said there that i think we should make really clear as well comforting your pet when they are scared of fireworks mm-hmm. is not reinforcing that behavior mm-hmm. so make sure you give them as much love and support and attention as they need to get them through that yeah. terrifying sound event exactly um, and if you have noticed maybe for the first time with your newer pet or your rescue pet that or maybe just you know your pet's been fine for the last five years but this year the fireworks really terrified yeah them. seek behavioral support as soon as you can mm-hmm. talk to your vet talk to Natalie as she said we're probably not going to fix it but we're going to get you the strategies and the thought process in place early enough that next time it happens you know what you're going to do and how you're going to cope with that Mm -hmm. and that's a great point actually Uh, yeah just reinforcing that it's okay to do that and that you're not creating worse habits by doing that because ultimately at the end of the day you're their world you're their safety blanket so Mm -hmm. why shouldn't you be doing that to support them in their time of need Exactly. And that that comes with a um, as long as they're seeking it. Yes. Because some pets will want to go under the stairs, under the toilet, you know, yeah. wherever Quietly exactly. Yeah. And of Don't course, you can be presence. there for them. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, L- let them comfort themselves however they can. That might be you. Yeah. That might be a, a cubby hole somewhere. Yeah. Great point. And then moving from. Um, autumn into winter or could be summer in the uk but just talking about snow (laughs) (laughs) i mean it it, it could be at any point it could be never right you you never quite know what's going on with the the uk weather but whether you're a fan or not what do we need to know about freezing temperatures and snow when it comes to cats dogs and even horses they are so much fun but the same in the same way that we and our children and our families can get cold pets can get cold too um again they do have their nice thick coats and they can go out and have fun um, usually much better than us they don't need to wrap up with their woolly hats and gloves and scarves uh, you are going to have the odd pet we've talked about that needs the coat so yep. particularly when the snow's out you're going to want to wrap them up nice yep. and warm um Be aware with dogs, I suppose, that they can go out in the deep snow and end up with the big kind of snowballs in their paws. So that is a time when you might need to come home and give them a little dip in that uh, sheep dip. Is it? Yep. That was was exactly what that was for with Jack as well. He had long hair. And again, I I tried to keep that trim, but he would get little snowballs. They will get them. So a lukewarm bath on the way through melted them all and off we go. Exactly. So you can usually tell when they've got those stuck because they're kind of prancing around in the snow. (laughs) flicking their feet as they go if you have a dog that will tolerate boots that'll help but i've never seen one keep them on they tend to hate them so stick with a wash um and the other thing is cats just if you have a cat that goes outdoors make sure they can come home they don't want to get stuck out in that weather um and if you have a cat that isn't keen on coming home or you know there's a local stray that you're kind of looking after a little bit yeah um make sure they've got a warm shed or a garage that they can access that just gives them a little bit of shelter yeah Horses, it's the same. I mean, they're built for all weathers in the UK, um, but they do need to be rubbed up when, yeah. when they're out and about, when the weather is cold enough, um, and making sure they've got that warm stable when they need to go back in as well. Yeah. And anything to think about when you get them home, like getting them warm again, I suppose it's it's okay just to let them warm up unless there's something a bit more serious with them and unless they've got like hypothermia or something like that. Yeah. Are they okay just to warm up naturally or? Generally, yes. Um, it's not as much of a problem when they get cooler than it is when they get the heat stroke in the summer um, and you have to be a little bit more careful I'd say obviously if a you know a cat's been away for a week and they come home and they're stone cold then um, 
they're going to get, you know how your, your fingers and your heart and your toes, if they've been that numb, they're going to yeah. get pins and needles as they start to warm. You want to do things gradually or they're likely to have similar sensations. There's no proof of it, but we can't ask them. So we'll just have to assume. Yeah. Um, I think particularly if they've been very wet though, if it's a cold winter rain or they've come back and they're little dogs that have been running in the snow and they're soaked through, yeah. um, just making sure they dry out. Uh, you can help them with towels or... I don't know if you've used hair dryers. I had a dog that used to love it. He used to sit there and just put his head back. And sit there like, like a L'Oreal moment. Yeah, because exactly. yeah. totally I'm worth it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And <laughs> um, they'll let you do that on a cool setting, something like that. That's fine. But just, I suppose, keeping an eye on them as they dry out, making sure they are warm, they're not shivering, and they're yeah. not displaying any behaviour that suggests they feel unwell. Yeah, great. Thank you. One of the biggest risks in my house is that uh, my little Jack Russell mouse uh, melts in front of the log burner. Ah, so she loves the heat. Yeah, and so I have to keep an eye on her because she'll yeah. just lie there until she's dehydrated. Yeah. So, um, yeah, don't go too far the other way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, you've talked about the symptom checker as well, Sam, as part of the Joy app. What kind of what are some of the key things that you see around autumn and winter? Do you have kind of peaks in different things that people are searching for in the symptom checker? Yeah, it changes um, constantly what people are looking mm -hmm. for. And like you say, um, there are seasonal trends that we tend to see. So if you're looking a bit further into the year at Christmas, it's all about, should my pet have eaten that? That's a yes. really common one. Um, around autumn, we do tend to see a peak in uh, skin problems. So cuts and grazes, things like that. As the weather gets wetter, pets can sometimes be a bit clumsier. And yep. so there's more hidden, hidden uh, Debris. Uh, risks, yeah, yeah, debris in puddles and in the woods and things like that. Um, and also a little bit of a peek around upset tummies as well. Um, you'll also start to get those toxin queries, uh, things like the antifreeze and the things we yeah. bring out over winter and autumn that we haven't used over summer. So uh, if you have a question, our symptom checker can answer it for you. And if it can't, it'll tell you and send you to a person who can. Fabulous. Thanks, Sam. So, Sam, from a veterinary perspective, what's the toughest thing for, for pet owners in, in the autumn and winter season, do you think? I think the toughest thing in autumn and winter is making sure, for those high energy, energy dogs, maybe like Sky, is making sure they get the stimulation. Yeah. Often you get so set in a pattern that walk equals tired out. Um, and as your days get shorter and your energy starts to ebb a little bit, you don't necessarily want to do those two hour hikes in the evening after work. Yeah. Um, so I think if we, we listen to what Natalie said and we have a think about how can we keep them mentally stimulated? I know a good jigsaw puzzle or a good kind of Sudoku will keep me tired out just as yeah. good as a run. Um, the same happens for our pets. So don't judge yourself for what you're not doing. Yeah. Think about different ways to, to keep your pet happy and healthy. Fab, thank you. And uh, Nat, is there anything that you would give people advice on how they can be a more responsible pet owner during the autumn and winter seasons? Um, yeah, I think, you know, going along the lines of those environmental changes. So if you've got a summer puppy, yep. you may have had the doors open all the time and suddenly in the mm, autumn you point. start shutting them yeah and your toilet training goes out the window okay so things like you know making sure they've got access to that outside um being careful on walks if you are going out in the dark mm -hmm. you know um i've had a lot of clients that uh their dogs become more sound sensitive in the dark because they've lost that um, ability to see the stimulus from a visual point of view okay. and actually you know like on a wet road the traffic noise is amplified mm. massively um, so just really be careful with what you're doing with your dog and if it's the first time they're experiencing kind of a dark walk just you know hang around in the driveway for a bit go go and walk around Lidl car park yeah <laughs> you know it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as they're having a good time um and for those of you out there that have you know terriers spaniels pointers yeah just watch out for the increased wildlife um <laughs> around autumn so you've got the deer up in yeah. october so there's going to be a lot more um activity yeah. around uh hedgehogs badgers foxes you know suddenly the night time is theirs yeah. So don't be surprised if 
um, your dog either doesn't want to go outside or wants to go outside yes. to, to sniff the perimeter. Mm. Yes. In which case you might need to go back to basics with your come back in to go to bed. Yeah, training. that's my life every night. She <laughs> runs outside <laughs> and is you. like, oh, there's so much fun out here. But she winds Charlie up as well. So Charlie now runs out there as soon as the doors open. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she's just out sniffing around going, oh, what's been in the garden while I st- whilst I've been inside? Right, I could talk about this for hours, absolutely, but we do need to start wrapping it up. So just uh, for both of you, um, mm-hmm. Sam, if we come to you first, what's your favorite pet related thing about this time of year? Cuddles on the sofa <sighs> in front of a nice warm fire. Nice. <laughs> you can't beat it. Yeah. <laughs> Family or pets, or all of them at once. I know, that's cheating now, Nat, because you can't have that Sorry, one. Sorry, yeah, I know. What I would be your favourite? Be yeah. Because um, you mentioned the log burner as well. I feel like Stan yeah. kind of stole that. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> I cuddle on the sofa all year round. It's, it's yeah. my life. Um, what do I like? Oh, I know what I like. I love those days where it's bright blue sky and frosty. Oh, crisp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah because you can be all warm and cozy, take a coffee with you on your walk, no muddy feet to to sort out when you get back. Yeah. And yeah, the dogs seem to really enjoy it because it's nice and cool. Yeah, so, no, I love yeah, they're that. My favorite, favorite mornings, frosty morning. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for, for coming in. And as I said earlier, Sam, not scaring you off from last season. <laughs> it's been great to have you back in and, and thanks for coming along as well, Nat. And I can't wait to speak to you guys next week as well. So thanks for coming back because we're going to talk all things cats, which is really exciting. They tend to get left behind a little bit because I am a dog owner. It's not that I'm not a cat lover. I adore cats as well. Just happen to be allergic to them, which is why I can't have them. Oh, no. I know. I wasn't when I was growing up. Um, but since I left home, I'm now allergic yeah. to cats, yeah. which is really sad. Although I'm not sure they would like Sky so much. But <laughs> we're dedicating a whole episode to all things cats. So I can't wait to talk to you guys again next week. Can't, can't wait. Can't wait. Thank you to all of our listeners. You can find out news about our podcast on our Instagram or TikTok handles, which is at Animal Friends Insurance, or on our Facebook page at Animal Friends Pet Insurance.